Now, the Industrial Workers Union, Kiusa, is calling for the abolishment of monarchs in South Africa. It raises concerns following the recognition on Saturday of Amazulu King. Mrs. Zulgazuel Tini is saying the ceremony cost taxpayers millions of rands. Uh, to get a different perspective on the matter, we are now joined by Giusa President Mame Kwe Sibe, as well as Controller Lesser General Secretary uh, Zolani Mkiba. And we're taking your thoughts tonight on 072 The question is, uh, should royal families continue uh, receiving grants uh, from public funds? Your thoughts on that as we get into the debate uh, tonight. Dennis Bay, good evening. And Kiraz uh, Mkiba, good to have you. And thank you very much for your time. Dennis Bay, let's start uh, with you. Traditional communities, traditional council Broad, broadly speaking, the institution of traditional leadership uh, is, is recognized within the uh, constitution of South Africa, within the government uh, frameworks. Uh, it, it's something that has been recognized for a while. What the decision to, to raise this issue right now? Obviously, it is the fact that um, 28 years into democracy, we see the royal power being used um, to accumulate power and wealth for a tiny layer of society that, uh, of course, is reigning as a senior traditional leaders in particular, but also a cohort of, you know, um, you know, people around them, uh, your royal aides, all of that. Now, the fact of the matter here is that for the working class people in these areas, these institutions are about traditions, they are about culture, but what you are seeing is not about that is a layer that is misusing its power to become what arguably is a billionaire class in this country. You look what is happening in KZN. The king himself will be earning 1.3 trillion, uh, 1.3 million uh, in an annual salary according to the government commission, uh, the government report on this. Um, in addition to that, the royal family has been allocated 67 million. They own Ngonyama Trust, um, which is an entity where the king is a sole trustee owning 2.8 million hectares of land. To put it into perspective, that is about 30% of land in KZN. They are making over 100 million charging renters to ordinary people who have lived in those lands for generations. And they are using this money for what? According to the last report of the Auditor General, the trustees could not even account for over 24 billion worth of assets. But the situation is not limited to KZN. You are looking at what's happening in the platinum beds of Rustenburg, of Limpopo. In Rustenburg, you have Real Mofuki. That um, is a, a company worth 42 billion dollars, right? In the areas of Pugin, where the levels of poverty, unemployment is devastating to say the least. The Bahatas are not an exception. Both Bahata Bagafela, but also Bahata of Macau, the Mutsipes that we know, are part of Africa and, of course, the world's billionaire class in the context of the devastating levels of poverty in communities in whose name they reign. And what we are saying that this has nothing to do with culture. It has to do with an accumulation of power and, of course, a world <coughs> that benefits a tiny layer of society that play absolutely no meaningful role in so far as rendering the public services and upliftment of communities that they are supposed to serve. Dr. Mkiva, it has nothing to do with culture, in other words, nothing to do with being custodians of customary law, but uh, it's um, about propping up a few to become uh, millionaires through the abuse of power. Yes. No, th thank you, Tawo. <clears throat> it's quite a shame that um, we hear this statement from an, a fellow African. Um, <clears throat> but you cannot blame some of our people because of the miseducation of the apartheid system. Look, the institution of traditional leadership predates coloniality and apartheid in this country. It represents the custodianship of our heritage, our culture, our history, as well as our experience. When we waged war against colonialists, those wars were led in the front line by traditional leadership. If you go back in history, in the wars of resistance and the wars of dispossession, these royal families and traditional institutions suffered the most. And I also want to indicate here, Tabo, that uh, the institution of traditional leadership in Africa is totally different from the aristocrats of Europe. Our leaders are the servants of their people. And in our tradition, 
they don't exist as an individual. They are the embodiment and the mirror of the society they represent. They do not take decisions outside of their community. The institution itself is an organ of people's power. Therefore, it is an institution that is fully embedded in the community. Anything that happens, it happens with the full blessings of the population of any given community in South Africa. Secondly, I want to say to my dear brother, uh, he is chasing the lizards when the crocodiles are basking in the sun. The issue of the class question in South Africa, it is not a creation of the institution of traditional leadership. We were dispossessed of our land, and technically we're also dispossessed of our wealth. The bulk of the wealth in this country is still firmly in the hands of the people of European origin. And uh, we are, as an institution ourselves, still pursuing the quest of the full restoration of our land as well as our, our wealth. And therefore, I think, my brother, you are totally misrepresenting the facts. I've read your document. Uh, it has got, it is full of inaccuracies in terms of historical account. And, and, and the way you also define the institution of traditional leadership, you are painting it with the same brush as the imperial and colonial institutions of royalty. We are different. The traditional leaders here in South Africa in particular, they live amongst the people and they serve the people 24 hours a day. If you go to Amagomkul, you will find that if a traditional leader has a car, that car is a taxi for the community. It is an ambulance when someone is sick in that community. It becomes a hearse when someone passes on. So Ikomkulu itself, the home of a traditional leader, is a place of convergence, and it is owned by the community. People don't go there through an, a, an appointment. They are always welcome to go there. And also this issue that they live an opulent life is totally a misrepresentation of the facts. Look, uh, we must be true to ourselves and begin to say our culture was relegated to the background by the colonial government, including the apartheid government. And we must locate the definition of traditional leadership in that context, that they are the custodians of our culture and who are trying to mainstream our culture as part and parcel of decolonization of a post-colonial country. And therefore, the institution of traditional leadership is very central in terms of our culture. The issue of resources that you are talking about, which you are saying are being wasted, I think that's a miscalculation as well. Because some of these resources you are talking about are so minimal uh, to the extent that if you were to compare um, just the read dance ceremony as to what does it attract in terms of local co uh, uh, tourism, what does it attract in terms of local economic uh, development. So many people benefit, and the money that goes into the system is actually, you know, if, if you were to do the counting, it, 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 it surpasses by millions yeah. of rents in terms of the contribution right. that it makes into the let, economy. Let, let, let's jump in here and allow uh, the survey to, to, to also dig in. So uh, with, with those opening remarks, let's, let's just focus in then on, on some of the key issues. For example, the issues around the legitimacy of the institution of traditional leadership. Are you misunderstanding, Mr. Sipe, what that legitimacy is, is, is derived from? Uh, according to Contralesa, that is derived actually from the people, the traditional communities themselves. For example, the makeup of the kingship or the queenship would be 60% from the royal family and 40% from members who are elected by that, by that particular community. Firstly, let's get one thing very clear. One is that um, to, to suggest that there is an uninterrupted continuation between the pre-colonial institution of traditional leadership and what we are having today in a form of the regal power in Canada or rather predicated on the modern class and property relations. Um, you know, that, that is to misreadery. Of course, um, institution in that sense uh, predate um, colonialism, but we know if you take even the history of KZN itself, the people of KZN were defeated with the institution since 1879. 
the people of KZN as we have effectively not even had a genuinely independent and autonomous kingdom in that sense. The successive regimes of British colonialism and apartheid reinvented the system in order that they can be able to legitimize um, a colonial style land dispossession that unfortunately are continuing, particularly in many areas that are affected by mining. Platinum belt of, you know, you are asking the girl in Popo, you see where big multinational companies come and all that they have to do is to receive the consent on the king in the context of a completely different property relation to those that prevailed pre-colonial era, where the land belonged to a community in community in that sense. Today, the, 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 the trusteeship over a cooperate entities that have been created, Ngonaba Trust be one of them, but also the companies of Bahatas, the companies um, in many areas that uh, are supposed to be administered by the kings, the queens, the chiefs, on behalf of the people, they are benefiting those people. Uh, and not the, 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 the what called the surrounding communities. In any event, what are we arguing? We are arguing that in a Republican democracy, governmental or public power must vest and only be derived on the, from, from the principle of election. Only democratically elected, accountable officials should be entrusted with governmental power. And what are we having here? We are saying if it is about culture, nothing stops. People that want to live in a traditional communal owned property to do so, of course, in a way that is consistent with their rights and consent, but also uh, as a voluntary cultural association that are funded by voluntary contributions of their members and their constituencies. Governmental funds must be used for public service, and that is what is going to happen. That's not what is happening here. All right. Traditional leadership should form associations and be, be funded by those indigenous communities who, who, who support uh, that particular uh, uh, kingdom. Uh, Tavo, we, we are a, I want to tell my brother that we are a republic of a special type. Simply because when this republic was established, it was established by colonialists. And for it to resonate with its own community, it has to take into account some of the nuances which were there long before it was actually established. You cannot simply negate a very important institution, which is an instrument of social cohesion in our community. The, my brother, what he's saying is, is his view, and he's entitled to that view because we have the freedom of speech in our country. But the fact of the matter, the institution of traditional leadership has legitimacy and credibility in the eyes of the people. And uh, even if it were to be put into test, you would find that the millions of South Africans will still uh, vote in its defense because they believe it ought to be part and parcel of the social fabric of our society. And therefore, our role even as contra lesser is very clear in saying that we are mainstreaming this institution so that it remains relevant even in a, in, in a post-colonial republic uh, so that this republic can resonate, you know, with the lives of the people in terms of their cultural outlook. So what you are saying, actually, you are continuing with a communique and a trajectory which was started by the colonialists because when they came here, they undermine the institution of traditional leadership and they tried everything and every trick above and below the sun to destroy this institution simply because they wanted us as Africans to pay allegiance to the kingship or the queenship of England. But we fought to the nail. We, we fought until the last drop of blood uh, of our people to defend this institution. And we were never defeated by colonialists, because if they had defeated us, they would have liquidated this institution. It would not exist as they had done so in other areas in the world, including the Americas. But here, I want to tell you that the British and the Dutch, they never defeated us, but we lost some of the battles. It is as a result of certain treaties that were signed with them as part and parcel of the post-war encounters. And I want to tell you that the reason why this institution still exists is because it is fully cemented uh, into people 
of this country. You cannot separate the traditional leader from his people. You cannot separate the traditional leader from the land. The traditional leader is the custodian of the land on behalf of his own people. Therefore, we must be very clear that uh, we must not come up with a communique that continues a narrative, a wrong narrative, which was actually started by colonialists. Because by default and by, by commission, you are continuing with what the colonists try to do. This is an institution which is very much our own thing as Africans. So we must not be misguided and, and be misinformed and, 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 and then misrepresent the facts. And I, I agree that there were some traditional leaders in the process who were co-opted by the system and who were used to beautify the apartheid system. And Contralesa, for instance, was founded against that background to begin to say that our name of this institution can never be used to beautify apartheid. That is why Contralesa is part and parcel of the womb of the liberation struggle in this country. And therefore, please, refrain from labeling this institution as a colonial institution. This is a people's institution which is family African in character and family African in spirit and letter. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll continue get response from Gewusa as well as your thoughts tonight. 072-110-5584. Should royal families in South Africa continue to be grant, getting grants from public funds? What are your thoughts? We'll talk to that next. You're back on In Focus still with Gewusa President uh, Mamet Resibe and Contra Lesa General Secretary Azulani Mkivan taking your thoughts. 072-110-5584 on this debate. Should Royalty in South Africa, broadly speaking, continue to be getting grants from public funds. So, Dr. Mkiva, the, the, the issue being raised, I'm sure you've seen that document and you've perused it quite intensely, is the issue that's been raised again. 67 million rands, for example, for argument said, which is the budget that the Zulu royal family is receiving from the Gozulu Natal province. Um, Giwusa arguing that that money goes to catering for royal palaces, fleet of cars, payment for, for royal aids, praise singers, school fees for the royal children, and so on and so forth. None of that going, for example, to the community which has been ravaged by floods currently seeking accommodation. How, how do you co 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 consolidate the two? <clears throat> no, firstly, it is an assumption that that money goes to all these things that he has listed. Uh, people tend to just make assumptions without making a research and getting to the bottom of what actually that budget does. This budget <clears throat> supports the work of the king, including developmental work for that matter. I think <clears throat> you, 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 you must advise our friend to actually come closer to the situation and get to understand in detail and integrity as to what actually uh, goes there. <clears throat> that amount of money assists the king as he is pioneering and championing development in his area of jurisdiction. And I don't think that it's a lot of money for what uh, it, it does. I made an example that the king does some of these ceremonies. And if you look just on those ceremonies, which gets done, which are actually funded from the same budget, uh, those ceremonies, the return on investment is actually humongous and it makes a huge impact in terms of the gross domestic product of the KZN uh, government. And, um, you know, it brings about uh, the increment in the numbers of tourists, bo both from South Africa, from the neighboring states, and, uh, and from the world over. But it also helps us as a country, you know, in terms of exporting uh, our culture with its, unique, with, with its uniqueness and antiquity to even attract greater numbers. Many tourists are coming to our shores because of some of the spectra which is displayed through these cultural practices. And therefore, you ought when to make such a statement, to juxtapose it against what we get from what we put in. Yeah. So there's an issue of, a logical issue here of input and output when it comes to the usage of the resources. Right. I believe that even the amount of money that you are putting just for the KZN King is not enough. The potential of bringing billions of, of rents into our economy 
if we were to have a focused attention in promoting some of these cultural practices, we will bring people not only from the Western Europe, but we will bring people from the BRICS family, from the Americas, and across yeah. across the across the world. Right. So I am saying that uh, yes, the government spends this money. But this money, there's return on investment. Definitely, I can that, assure that, that is you. Let's, that, let's be practical about it. Uh, the controllers are saying it's not true that that 67 million would just be spent on cars and school fees and the, and, and the likes. There's a whole lot more. For example, the weekend uh, event, it is said by the MEC of uh, Economic Development there that it, it brought in close to 130 million rands in terms of GDP exactly my point. To, 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 to the province. Da does that justify the kind of spend? First thing, let's start with the first issue. One, the account for how the 67 million is being utilized is not from me. I got it from the MEC in KZN when he was explaining how that budget is being used. It's been used to maintain palaces. It's been used to maintain cars. It's been used to pay the aids to the king, the sing, play singers, and all of that. That is the MEC, not myself. Secondly, the issue of the allocation from the province, the salary, is but merely a tip of an iceberg, right? According to the, the statement of the Ingonyama Trust, I think in one year, uh, the, the last thing, the last financial year, they generated over 118 million dollars. How are we seeing that money? From the 2019 Auditor General's report, the trustees could not account for over 24 billion dollars. Now, why, how do we end up with the problems like that in a situation where the kings are at one with their people? How do you say that Royal Abafukim, for instance, is at one with the community? It does everything on the basis of the mandate of the community when it has asset worth over 42 billion in a context of devastating levels of unemployment, of poverty, which I dare to argue. All that you need is just a fraction of that money. If you have ever been to Pukin, just to build homes, just to build a basic infrastructure to ensure a decent conditions of life, you don't even need 40 billion. Probably 10, 20 billion will go a long way in making that difference. How do you say that what is happening in Bahatabaga Fela is acceptable when the, the, the chiefs are actually ceding the land to multinational companies, becoming in exchange for shareholding that goes to them and the properties that they are supposed to administer in the interest of the community and turn up and say that there are leadership of community that need to be consulted. So there are applicants for the mining rights. At the same time, there are people that need to be consulted. And communities, notwithstanding their protestations, mining rights are being granted. And who becomes rich? Yeah. It's not people of Akata. If you have ever been to, to, to that area, you would know what I'm talking about. Their story is no different from the story of the most poorest communities in this country. But more than that, what is not being argued here is nobody says we're going to prohibit that institution. All we are saying is, like churches, I mean, the, the king himself, well, is a Christian and supposedly agrees, I mean, I, I, I can imagine that he would say that, well, uh, God is the highest uh, authority. And we don't have theocracy in this country. We just say we are going to build a secular republic. Churches are supported by millions of people in this country, but they are not receiving money from taxes. They are not having a say and exercise of governmental power, which we say in a republican democracy must be based on elective principle and democratic participation. Let's uh, wrap it up, uh, Datum Kiva, and, and uh, talk about the... Is there a point to be made about the disbursement or the distribution of wealth that is accumulated within the traditional leadership? No, certainly. If you go to the Royal Bafu Gang, I think the system that they use there, they work with all traditional leaders and they work with the community. And there is definitely a system which benefits the community. If you see the investments which they have done right in their area, upscaling, and I think my brother is confusing the, 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 the asset value of what the Royal Bafu Gang has. He's confusing that and he thinks that Royal Bafu Gang is sitting with a cash of 42 billion in the bank. It's untrue. It is the asset value of 
the whole operation, the whole mining operation and the assets that are attached to that. And on year to year, the Royal Bafu Gang declares dividends for its community and some of that money goes into the investments in their community. But of course, I cannot say that it is perfect in terms of what is happening there. But it is a good story to tell from a point of view of an institution of traditional leadership that has managed to to reach that kind of success and achievement and to be able to build, even to donate uh, some of the resources to the municipality of Rustenburg to build stadiums, to build, uh, uh, you know, civic centers and to, to actually construct highways. Uh, this is what they do. And all you are doing, you are looking only for the negatives. So I'm saying that that's what they do. If, if in Bahaka Bahafela, they, they have built a world-class traditional council authority offices, which has never been seen in this country, which has never been built even by government. They have built it on their own to serve and service their people. They have built hospitals. They have also built stadiums. Go to Moroland and see the great work there that is being done by Jose Pilani. So I am saying that uh, you must not always try to look for negatives. There are good stories to tell which are done by the institution of traditional leadership. Of course, I am worried about the fact that you are looking at one side. These are peanuts compared to teams of trillions which are sitting with big conglomerates and that are doing nothing but are disinvesting in South Africa, are taking millions and billions of rents, striking against our economy, and you are busy uh, looking on the side of what you are trying to do to help our society, to help our communities that are in the margins of our country, to bring them into the mainstream so that they can have a meaningful role in economy. We have been able through those royal families that have been able to participate in the mainstream economy to create jobs, to ensure that we deal with poverty alleviation in their areas, and at the same time to ensure that we take thousands of the young people in our areas and educate them, and educate them and giving them relevant education. Gentlemen, we're out of time. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much uh, for coming on and engaging with us in this conversation. Uh, that is uh, Mame Klesi Bey, General Industries Workers Union of South Africa President, who's raised this issue. Zolanim Kiva, of course, responding to that. Let's look at your thoughts tonight on WhatsApp, 72 110 is what you had to say. In the Western Cape, I agree with the union. This is not uh, questioning the legitimacy of traditional leadership, but the question is what are they doing to ensure that their communities they reign in are developed? Emmanuel in Bloemfontein, I think it's imperative that a performance-based approach is adopted to assess the performance of each traditional council against cleaner deliverables such as local economic development, etc. It can't be free for all budget that comes annually even when nothing is done to uplift the community. Vinny in Joburg, the spokesperson for Contralesa, is educating South Africans for free. Thanks to the gentleman on the other chair, we are who we are because of the traditions and culture we are in. Not very confused with the developing world's new look of government. All right.